we uh, have a subject which was deliberately chosen because um, it was uh, provincial, not federal in jurisdiction. Um, it's an issue which has been current and topical, but for the most part is completed. So we don't put our panelists in the difficult position of talking about existing cases which are ongoing. And uh, thirdly, there was no shortage of qualified people, both lawyers and non-lawyers, uh, willing to talk now about this very interesting uh, saga in the uh, history of policy making in the province of Ontario. To chair and organize a panel is my partner, Michael Goff, who is uh, uniquely qualified for this role. Prior to joining um, our law firm at Osler Hoskin in 1985, Michael uh, served virtually all of his career in the public service, the province of Ontario, or related agencies. He uh, was senior solicitor in the Ministry of Consumer and Commercial Relations, whose deputy is coming to be our keynote speaker. Um, he's advised the province uh, on constitutional matters relating to natural resources, powers of the economy, patriation of the Constitution. Uh, between 1974 and 1981, crucial years in the development of the province, he was Director of Legal Services for the Ministry of Treasury and Economics, really the, the heart of the Ontario government at that time. And then um, in the gradual transition from public sector to private sector, he began to become privatized through his work uh, for the Urban Transportation Development Corporation Limited, where he was a, a senior officer as well as a solicitor. So, Michael, would you chair the uh, panel on auto insurance and introduce the other two, please? Thank you, Ron. Our first panelist this morning is Harry Brown, a member of the Toronto law firm of Iacona and Brown. Harry's appeared before various standing committees dealing with uh, insurance issues. The, first of all, he attended all of the hearings of the insurance board, particularly the no-fault hearings in 1989. He's appeared before various standing committees of the legislature uh, dealing with Bills 68 and 164, amendments to Ontario's Insurance Act dealing with, with uh, no-fault insurance. Uh, Harry, uh, who specializes in insurance law and, and litigation, was, was called to the bar in 74. He's uh, a past instructor of the bar admissions course and a, and a member of the Arbitrators Institute of Canada. Harry's going to attempt to put some framework and historical perspective uh, around uh, the various insurance-related issues because there's a number of insurance issues that we're going to examine today and, uh, and the lobbying effort that went into them. And, uh, and, it's a, and it's a perspective that spans almost 10 years, I, I think, Harry. Yes. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, what I want to do is uh, lay the historical framework for the reasons why we had such turmoil in the auto insurance area in Ontario in uh, the late 80s in particular, resulting in the present uh, insurance product being Bill 68, the OMPP, and of course we're now going into, as of January 1st, 1994, the Bill 164, uh, the Road Ahead product. Um, I've really identified what I think are three essential driving forces um, that are involved that are important for lobbyists to understand. The first one was the affordability issue which I think was the prime driving force in the changes that were required. The second I'm going to call the reform issue, that is the product reform that, uh, that was attempted. And the third I'm going to identify as being the politics stroke uh, ideology considerations. Um, the affordability issue was one dealing with the cost of the product. And it was brought about, for example, by the addition to the product of many additional benefits that weren't equally compensated for at adequate uh, premium levels to the insurers. Such things as the accident benefits that were added onto the policy in 72 and virtually doubled in 78. And 78 was a good year for, for uh, consumers because they also added on prejudgment interest, added on Family Law Reform Act claims. But, um, and throughout, I should say, from the 80s, you had what uh, Coulter, Justice Coulter Osborne identified as social inflation. The cost of awards were higher than the uh, consumer price index. Um, but in 79 to 82, 83 period, you had a unique economic situation in this province, which also dramatically uh, contributed to the problems of automobile insurance or perceived problems. And that was the extremely high interest rates. So that interest rates in this province during that period reached at one point about 21 percent, I believe. And what the insurers tended to do during that period of time was they decided to either keep their level of uh, increase uh, flat for automobile premiums or in some cases they actually reduced them to try and uh, garner more premium income to put into their investment portfolios to, uh, to gain more income or more ultimate profit from that source. 
Uh, the problem was that when the interest rates uh, declined precipitously in the 82 period that uh, they found themselves with inadequate uh, rate levels and uh, virtually no investment income but significantly increasing claims. Uh, the other problem they had in the 83, 84, 85 period was because of the economic boom in Ontario, you had, um, you had more people driving but a higher frequency of accidents because of that in part. And also you had a uh, higher what they call severity index, which means that um, in 82 you might have had a real estate agent driving a nice uh, cheap Volkswagen Beetle earning $20,000 a year, but in 85, 86 that same agent was driving a BMW earning $100,000 per year. And when that person had an accident, the, uh, the cost to the insurance company of a claim was significantly higher. So what happened in the 84, uh, 85, 86 and up to um, about April 25th, 1987, was almost punitive increases in premiums by the insurers, a kind of a quick catch-up, which in some cases involved premium increases per year of uh, 25 to 45 percent. So that this naturally uh, produced an outrage among uh, drivers and consumers who had to pay these increases in premiums who didn't fathom the underlying reasons for the uh, sudden catch-up. Um, on April 25th, 1987, the uh, Minister Monty Quinter introduced his uh, um, his uh, cap or freeze on insurance uh, price increases, which continued up to about uh, 1990, subject to the Ontario Automobile Insurance Board allowing some very modest increases. Um, so that uh, we had a whole series of, uh, of responses to that, uh, uh, to these problems, being the Slater, our Ontario Task Force uh, on Insurance in 86, uh, followed after Monty Quinter's announcement, we had the, uh, the Colder Osborne inquiry and um, then ultimately we had the Ontario Automobile Insurance Rate Board, which was designed, I think, in terms of policy to control the rate of increases of automobile insurance premiums and to have the public feel comfortable with what was a reasonable return in equity and to indicate that uh, the price increases were justified. Uh, instead, what happened was, um, through those hearings, there was a very strong media coverage and a lot of the CEOs, for example, of companies complained about the adequate uh, premium levels and uh, gave uh, estimates of uh, significant price increases, some in the range of 45, 50 percent, which caused uh, a further uh, decline, I think, in consumer confidence in the private sector to deliver the product at a reasonable price. Um, and ultimately, throughout the, uh, the hearings, what happened was after going through uh, all the various, uh, some of the reforms to the product, but uh, essentially coming out with a reasonable return on equity, and the government board actuary was suggesting a, uh, an increase to that product of 35 percent, <clears throat> which was, uh, you know, unacceptable to the consumers and I would say to the industry itself. Um, the only thing that I would say that was, I uh, um, have to be careful about this because George was the general manager of the OEIB, but I think politically one thing that came about from that uh, year-long process was the government realization that if you have a product or a widget that costs $1.10, you can't sell it for a dollar. And what is required is not necessarily price control, but what you need is to reform the product to make it cheaper, to make it more effective, more efficient. So that what we had, therefore, was Bill 68, which was to eliminate some of the claims that were not considered to be absolutely necessary and to, to use those monies to formulate a uh, first-party benefit package um, as part of the reform side and also to uh, reduce the ultimate fees uh, being charged to consumers and the uh, expected rate of increase of those. So Bill 68 was really brought about in a large part to uh, uh, deal with the affordability issue, which in fact it did. Uh, the second issue was the reform, reform movement. And I suppose I go back to 1963 when O'Connell and the States came forth with the concerns about the tort reparation system that indicated that it was, uh, it was uncertain depending upon a jury's view of liability and your, your particular witnesses or the strength of your counsel. You had uncertainty. You had a long delay in getting payments. Uh, for many people in the States who don't have like a Medicare type plan as we do up here or other uh, wage replacement plans. And uh, the cost of the system was dramatic. The uh, transaction cost, legal fees, uh, specialized evidence, accounting firms, uh, doctors and so forth. So there were major criticisms in 1973 we had the Michigan plan, which uh, was brought about primarily by the trade unionists in that state, who were concerned that many people who weren't part of trade unions did not have, um, uh, did not have access to any comprehensive medical plan or wage, wage replacement scheme. And uh, continuing up uh, throughout the, the Slater task force, 
I was reading again last night, and what I thought was interesting was they pinpointed the auto reparation scheme as being really uh, something that was different from the major reparation schemes in our, in our jurisdiction. For example, they said that um, the auto reparation scheme probably dealt with payments of about $250 million per year, but they identified the Medicare scheme, the OHIP, the WCB, Canada Pension Plan, the group disability, private disability coverages on a first party basis, that is you don't have to sue, you just pay a fee and you get the, uh, the product, as being approximately worth $5 billion per year. And they recommended a pure no-fault system or extremely high threshold. And then we have, uh, uh, later on, we have the, uh, the Osborne report, which in my view was responsible uh, for detailing the very first party benefit plan uh, under Bill 68, which uh, was considered to be extremely generous and which has been improved upon uh, by Bill 164. And I see people like uh, Harry Beatty of Arch in the audience here today, who was a very eloquent spokesperson, spokesperson for his group of the people who are very seriously injured in car accidents, quadriplegics, brain damaged, uh, who don't really care about liability. They only care about having the medical attention that, uh, that they felt they deserved for, for the premium they pay. So that by the end of the day, Bill 68 tried to address the two issues of affordability, and they also tried to address the concerns of the Slater task force by having a, a very high threshold and uh, also having a very enriched first party benefit plan that was part of the reform considerations. Um, but thirdly, let me turn to the uh, politics ideology. In my view, one of the significant events um, dealing with auto uh, in this particular province was in 7980 when they brought in the Compulsory Motor Vehicle Insurance Act which required everyone who owned a car to have insurance. Now I say it was a progressive thing to do and, and desirable thing to do, but once you have a product that everyone must, uh, must pay for, then obviously automobile insurance is regarded as a, um, as a necessity. And as necessities, it's going to obviously be subject to considerable regulation, such as energy prices, such as uh, Bell telephone rates. And um, from there, uh, we have, for example, in the reaction I'm looking at the NDP side of things because they're very prominent during this period of time. You have this total disruption and uh, extremely, um, uh, I think, uh, probably very uh, inappropriate pricing by the private insurers during the 84 to 86 period. And the NDP are doing um, their best to capitalize upon it. Um, you had the Peter Cormos and uh, Bob Ray wrote their manifesto on highway robbery, which became, I think, uh, most of you probably remember it and very effective in their, in their political ads and propaganda. And then you had, I thought, Mel Swart, uh, who was the NDP uh, uh, person who was responsible for automobile insurance, who I thought was a very effective campaigner for the NDP, who pointed out the existing government-run plans in other provinces, such as the Insurance Corporation of British Columbia, the Quebec plan, Autopac, and so forth, who in his view were doing exceptionally well. And his key point was saying, let's take the profit out of these plans, the private profit of the plans, and put it back into Harry Beatty's clients for better compensation for those seriously injured people, or put it back to the uh, consumers who are driving the vehicles and paying higher premiums. So it was a very kind of eloquent and understandable argument he was raising. Now my theory is that um, if Bill 68 had been put in place not on June 22, 1990, just before the election on September 6, but had been put in place about a year earlier, I suspect we probably wouldn't have the concerns with the NDP government later on. But in fact, because of the timing, uh, the NDP mounted a very large uh, attack on it, primarily through Peter Cormos. He did a very uh, long, I think about two weeks or three weeks filibuster, and um, he, he, he uh, seized on the, some of the inadequacies of the no-fault benefit schedule of Bill 68, um, professional caregivers, uh, other issues. And uh, he also seized on victims' rights. And um, so that by September 6, 1990, when the NDP unexpectedly won power, um, my view was that the issues of affordability had been largely addressed, the issues of, uh, of reform had been largely addressed, but you still had the political baggage and the concerns about the product that had been raised throughout all the hearings regarding high price increases, the private profit, and the uh, disruption of rights. And uh, that was the kind of scenario that we had as the NDP came into power. So I think that's a bit of the, the background leading up to, um, um, first of all, Bill 68 and its origins, and uh, then along I'll give it back to Michael with respect to the, uh, the government uh, issue. Thank you. Uh, before turning to George Cook, there's a brief video of, of news clips that sort of take public auto insurance right from the 
just prior to the election of the current government to that fateful decision al almost to the day, the, the first anniversary of Bob Ray assuming uh, the premiership of, uh, of the province. I don't know whether Graham would, uh, would dispute uh, whether it was an, an issue of, of religion or, or policy. I, I would have tended to think of uh, the NDP's platform on public auto insurance as, uh, as a matter of, uh, of uh, religion. And, uh, and seeing the remarkable turn, and, and it's that subject we'd like to talk about following the, uh, the clip in public auto insurance, um, it's, it's really quite interesting to review what, what occurred in terms of the lobbying activity. Can I ask you to please start that tape? I apologize in advance for some of the quality. Ontario is now a dead issue, at least for now. The NDP is about to back away from its main campaign promise as it marks its first anniversary in power. Our Queen's Park Bureau Chief, Robert Fisher. For Bob Ray, a government-run auto insurance system has always been the only answer for Ontario. If they want to vote for the insurance companies, if they want to vote for the establishment, well, they've got two other parties to choose from. But if they want to vote for a change, they'll come our way. The market can and should take the lead with the public playing a facilitating role. But in certain cases, such as the delivery of auto insurance, public leadership is a more effective and equitable solution. After a period of discussion, we will introduce in the spring a bill to reorganize the delivery of car insurance to the driving public. We plan to examine the experiences of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, British Columbia and Quebec, other jurisdictions in North America, and our previous provincial plans. Our intention is to create a system that will provide the best service at a reasonable cost to drivers and at the same time ensure access to a fair settlement of claims for personal and other damages. We believe that a driver-owned plan can provide the best service to the public. Now there's study out on the potential impact of government-run auto insurance in this province. And the picture is not a rosy one. The study was prepared for state farm insurance companies and it predicts the loss of thousands of jobs and a price tag in the billions. Our Queen's Park Bureau Chief Robert Fisher reports. The State Farm entry into the insurance debate comes as the Ray government prepares to unveil the specifics of a government-run auto insurance system sometime in October. If the government intends to substantially alter this sector, then it should prove to the public and to the industry that the benefits to be achieved are worth the costs, the disruptions, and the risks. A study by the accounting firm of Coopers and Librand done for State Farm predicts taxpayers and the economy will be hit hard by a fully government-run system. The elimination of as many as 10,000 insurance industry jobs, affecting mostly Metro Toronto and southwestern Ontario communities. And potential startup costs of $3.6 billion, including compensation for Canadian and American insurers, taken over by the government. International trade law and the Canada-U.S. free trade deal will play a role in determining that compensation. Both in a legal and a political context, one could anticipate government-to-government -government claims. And those claims could, according to Coopers and Librand, amount to $2 billion. State Farm says the study clearly indicates that the government has not adequately explored, nor does it fully appreciate the impact of a government-run auto insurance system on Ontario. As for the Premier, the new study is just well, another study. Uh, all I can say is, is, is that I'm prepared to read any report uh, uh, and to look at any information which is, uh, which is brought forward. Um, those, you know, those, those figures strike me as, uh, as certainly uh, high. And the careers we have chosen, we want our seniority, benefits, pensions, salary levels and vacations About 4,000 people turned out to demonstrate, everyone from company presidents to clerical workers, and they all had the same message about state-run auto insurance. And I just started, I'm a receptionist there, and I just feel that if the government takes over insurance, a lot of people lose their jobs. I'm an underwriter at Pilot Insurance, and if he takes over, where will I be? I have a daughter to take care of, I have to have a job to take care of her, and him taking over just isn't going to help me any. 
This demonstration comes just two days after a major insurance company released a study showing that state-run insurance would cost taxpayers billions of dollars and 10,000 permanent jobs would be lost. Some companies bust in workers for today's protest and provided them with box lunches. I'm president of Corset Insurance in Markham, and everything that I own is at stake. For I'm invested in a small business in Ontario. I have employees here with me that'll be out of work, or their hours will be cut back. And competition keeps price down, not government. There's no comment from financial institutions, Minister Brian Charlton. He's on holiday. One short year ago, it was a major plank in Bob Ray's election platform. It's ripped out. New Democrats will not be bringing up the system of public auto insurance. Good evening. This controversial car insurance decision capped the NDP's week-long retreat at Honey Harbor. Politically, it is a hot potato, but what about practically? What does it mean to your premiums? Our Greg Lubianeski found out. We have decided that we will not be proceeding with public auto insurance, and we will not be proceeding with it for two very simple reasons. Uh, it will cost too much money, uh, and it will cost too many jobs. According to Ray, $1.4 billion and 13,000 jobs. The Premier announcing plainly, simply, and confidently the party's decision to drop plans for government-run insurance. But now, says Ray, insurance companies are on the hook to lower auto insurance rates. We're holding them to their word. They've stated in uh, a lot of the ads that they put out, a lot of the, the statements that they've made, that they want to establish uh, uh, a, a better working relationship. And all I can say is, is that the public interest will be the test of that, and that we continue to have the, the power to regulate the industry, and we want to uh, make sure that uh, the public is uh, getting the the uh, the benefits to which we feel they're entitled the premier says he couldn't keep his election promise but he will keep insurance companies to their promise to lower rates he offers a possibility of 40 to 60 dollars a year less on the average insurance policy will insurers be able to do that well insurance companies have already reduced rates OMPP has only been in just a little over a year and insurance companies have realized that this is a good product we can reduce premiums we can give policyholders uh, the protection that they need at a fair dollar and I think given uh, a few more years for OMPP to work then in fact we'll see insurance premiums come down even further this decision may be a turning point for the NDP it was obvious by the premier's demeanor this afternoon this was a tough decision he made at least two references to this being a day of reckoning for the party that he now knows what it feels like to be a government in power on the question of whether public auto insurance will ever again be addressed we don't intend to revisit this question uh, or return to it uh, or uh, or relive it uh, believe me uh, <laughs> is uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Dominion of Canada General Insurance Company. Prior to that, he was with S.A. Murray Consulting as, uh, as a lobbyist, and before that was special partner to former Ontario Robert Nixon. George served as the manager of the Auto Insurance Board, now the Ontario Insurance Commission, where he helped to develop its approach to rate regulation. George has spent so long as a lobbyist in this industry and been so effective. It's my view that in 1982 they simply decided to give him a, co a company uh, to run of his own. Uh, George will be talking about his role as a lobbyist on the, the various no-fault amendments uh, to the Insurance Act and, uh, and his work with regard to the proposal uh, to institute a, a public ownership scheme of auto insurance. George. Thanks very much. Uh, first, let me say, as uh, one of the few non-lawyers uh, in the room, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here to, uh, to try to share with you some of my views. I think it's important, um, very briefly, to uh, summarize seven or eight points that, that, that one might call characteristics of a successful lobbyist. And I, I, I summarize these because I think they're generally applicable, but I also think that they uh, very much relate to the success the insurance industry had in both the ownership and the product campaign. And I think they also um, 
very much uh, could be taken the other way to explain why the lawyer's uh, lobby or the trial lobby was unsuccessful or relatively unsuccessful in many of its efforts. Um, somebody doesn't wake up some morning and all of a sudden decide that they're a lobbyist and, and, and hang out a shingle. Um, it's not something that you get a degree in from a university. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not something that you inherit because you're employed by a particular firm. Um, I think to be a successful lobbyist, uh, somebody has to understand uh, the machinery of government, the mechanics, how it works. I think as well one has to understand the policy and the priorities of any specific government. I don't believe necessarily that the partisan politics matter that much. They may alter the policy and the priorities, um, but you still have to take that step. I think it's important that people understand the personalities and the viewpoints of those that are, are involved in an issue or in a series of issues because it's really those personalities and those viewpoints that translate the policy and priorities into agendas. I think the fourth point that people should understand is that a successful lobbyist has to understand um, that if you push over here, you have to know where the poke is going to come from and what it might look like because there will always be some reaction. The question of credibility uh, comes very much to the fore. Um, if you're going to succeed in the business in the long term, you have to be seen by the people that you're lobbying um, as being somewhat honest and straightforward. There's no room for cutting corners. There's no room for cuteness. Um, there's a question of creativity. and I think some of the creativity of the insurance issue was captured fairly well in the, uh, in the news clips. Um, Perhaps most important, however, is, is the need to be consensus driven. A successful lobbyist always looks for an outcome that's a win-win rather than an outcome that's I win, you lose. And perhaps if I could, could be so bold or so, so aggressive to say so, one of the problems that I've found in my experience with litigation lawyers trying to turn themselves into lobbyists is they go from an environment where I win, you lose, I'm good to an environment where you have to seek compromise and find a way for the person that you've otherwise just defeated to look like they've won as well. And if I can share any message with you when we're talking about lawyers as lobbyists, I don't think that it's your innate legal training that will ever necessarily make you a good lawyer, or a good, uh, good lobbyist rather, may not make you a good lawyer either, but uh, a lobbyist rather, that, that it's something much different than that. And in fact, in some instances, the, the pressures that are placed upon many lawyers uh, uh, to be successful at their, at their legal occupation may well make them very poor, law poor lobbyists. I think as well, wherever possible, a successful lobbyist will address an issue before positions get crystallized. Um, that, that implies an ongoing awareness of what, what governments are doing and what's on their minds and what's possible. Now that's not always the case and certainly in, in the instance of auto insurance, um, uh, positions got quite crystallized both with the Liberal government and with the NDP government before, before the uh, lobbying activity really took place. Um, having been a, a civil servant, I can say that civil servants lobby. Judith, I hope you'll agree with that. Um, having been a political staffer, I can tell you that people on political staff lobby. Having been a lobbyist, I can tell you that lobbyists lobby. And now being a company president, I can tell you that we lobby too, but I put a but on the end of that. One of the, one of the things that, that I adhere to in a quite a strict way in my current role is that I retain a good lobbyist. I don't try to do it myself. Um, that's a mistake that, that many people make, in my view, and that you think that you can, you can still retain a competitive edge. It's something you used to do when you're doing something uh, different. And I think that's a, a trap that many people fall into. Let me just capture the, um, the sort of 87 to 90 period in a slightly different way than Harry did, um, although I don't think there's any inconsistency. But from the Liberal government point of view, faced with uh, uh, very rapidly increasing price considerations. Um, we'll have that ever famous remark of uh, Premier Peterson, or then Premier Peterson, of, quote, I have a plan, quote. Um, 
the odd part of it, if I may be so, so bold, was that if he did, um, no one around him was too sure what it was. And to the extent that the auto insurance rate board was part of the plan, it didn't achieve the end that many of the policymakers thought that it might, in that after uh, some very lengthy year-long review, rather than suggesting that companies were um, uh, over-earning and charging too much, the conclusion of, uh, of a reasonably objective board was that prices were about 35 percent too low. Rates needed to increase, and therefore there had to be a change. Um, public ownership certainly wasn't the answer. It had nothing to do with the problem. Uh, and so something had to happen to the product. Um, the insurance industry, um, during that period of time, starting prior to the election of 1987, had, uh, had established a very strong uh, grassroots lobby um, such that there was a representative of the industry in every riding of this province where, where key messages were able to be passed and, and generated at the grassroots level. And they were able not only to carry messages, but they were also able to receive messages. And I think as an industry had a reasonably good understanding of what was possible and what it would take on their part to allow the outcome they were looking for to take place. Put differently, they understood to a much greater extent than the legal lobby um, what interest group politics were all about. FAIR, on the other hand, um, in my view at least, never was able to cast aside a view that the key policy makers in the Peterson government had was that they were interested in self-interest and greed as opposed to um, some form of public policy outcome that would otherwise address the, uh, the concern that everybody was was really feeling, firstly price, and then secondly the timeliness and adequacy of, uh, of compensation. And they weren't able to shed that. Um, strangely enough, one of the best things that the insurance industry had going for it was the trial lobby on the other side. It was a wonderful foil uh, which, was, which was used in a, in a very constructive way if you were looking at it from the insurance side. I was in government at this point in time, partly as a civil servant, partly as a, as a political staffer, and so I offer those comments as not someone that was involved on either the fair or the industry side, but someone who was either being lobbied or lobbying from within. When the NDP came to power uh, in 1990, as the throne speech uh, remarks uh, from the Lieutenant Governor indicate, their position was fixed. But nobody was really sure where it had been fixed, or when it had been fixed, or why it had been fixed, or for that matter, what had been fixed. And when I say that, their position was, we will have public insurance. But very few people knew what public insurance was, and those that did know what it was usually interpreted it differently. Make it a little simpler, they very much confused the concepts of product and ownership. And one of the keys in my view, and at this point in time I was the lobbyist for the industry on the question of ownership, one of the keys to our success was that we recognized that confusion and rather than confront it in an aggressive way initially, uh, we were able to separate it and explain to the government through a, through a series of, uh, of uh, avenues and in a number of different ways um, that they did not need to own to control price, product, and practice. We were able to separate the two issues that otherwise uh, Minister Cormos, or then Minister Cormos, continued to talk about as public insurance. Um, I think the second key sets of messages involved uh, jobs and investment. And one of the reasons why they were so terribly important um, had to do with timing. Um, I believe very strongly if the industry had proceeded, as those in the labor debate did, on day one uh, with open confrontation with the government, when Ray was very popular um, and very much tied to uh, his uh, former constituents, uh, that we would have been quite unsuccessful. If, if there's a, a, a key that has not been written about that was absolutely critical to the success on ownership, it's the fact that the industry was able to understand the problem the government would have with market confidence arising from an unexpected deficit of some $10 billion in the spring of 1991, about six months before the government did. 
and they, we very consciously um, concluded that if in fact we were right that the deficit would be four times what anyone else thought it would be, that there would be a, at least a confidence issue that would be predominant and that that would be the time that you could attack or confront the Premier who otherwise was running at unprecedented levels in the public opinion polls. And so we took the six months to position ourselves, develop our third party support, uh, prepare our objective uh, uh, documents and papers to do an effective, very broad lobby waiting for the Premier's support to go into a free fall because we believe very strongly. So if you remember the ads and the demonstrations and the, and the uh, reports from, from third parties that talked about investment and jobs and the like, that did not happen until after the budget came out and the Premier had dropped something like 25 points in, in four weeks in the public opinion polls. So the timing, to my mind, was absolutely critical. Now, all the good analytical work would have been lost if it had been done five months earlier. I think the outcome would have been very different and there would have been no turnaround on public ownership. It's not a, everybody shares that view, but it's a view that I have. I think, it, I think it's absolutely critical. I think it's also important for people to realize that the public confrontation was not just sort of corporate Toronto or corporate Canada. Unlike the labor lobby, it wasn't guys in blue suits hugging trees at Queen's Park, but it was the workers. And you saw that in a very... Uh, a very uh, demonstrable way in the clips. And it wasn't workers that were organized by the corporate elite, it was workers that were allowed by those that they worked for to organize themselves and very much do their own thing. And so when you saw the, the rallies, they weren't, they weren't lobbyist organized rallies, they were worker organized lobbies, or rallies rather, that others, others facilitated. The timing may have been orchestrated, but the nature of the message, the nature of the demonstrations uh, were largely not. One last point, if I may. Um, the analysis that was undertaken uh, by the industry was always conservative. If the number was going to be 13,000 jobs lost, use 12,000. Nobody can challenge you on it. Conversely, the legal lobby went out of their way to overstate their case on every occasion and it was very easy to challenge their public opinion polling, it was very easy to challenge their estimates of economic loss and you blew the credibility at every point along the road. And the irony of it is, is that when Ray had to stand up and speak to the investment loss or the job loss, his numbers were more extreme than ours and hence our position must have been construed, I would argue, as having been credible. Um, in summary, what happened with the uh, trial bar? Um, I don't think they unscrambled the issue. I don't think they understood the timing. Their arguments were not conservatively put. Um, they were viewed as continually coming from a position motivated by greed. They didn't understand that price was a key and hence they never addressed it in any, uh, any meaningful public way. And they made no attempt to change or alter public perception. Um, that's pretty condemning, but I think that's what happens when you have people that aren't lobbyists trying to lobby. Um, Graham Scott made the point this morning that it would be interesting to uh, contrast the difference between uh, what happened on the labor bill and what happened in public ownership. Um, and there was almost a suggestion that, that the labor, labor bill had to proceed because it, it, the, 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 auto, the auto reversal had preceded it. Um, I disagree with that uh, very strongly. I will go to my grave believing that had those that organized the labor lobby applied the same principles to those that uh, organized the uh, ownership and the uh, various debates on uh, tort and no fault, that the outcome could have been very different on our labor bill here in Ontario. I think it was a failure on the part of those that were otherwise engaged in the debate. Thank, Thank you. you. George. Let me very, very briefly describe what we as lawyers did on the public auto insurance issue. Uh, we first of all identified uh, the expropriation provisions of the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement as, as being a, a basis for challenge, not heaven forbid that we'd ever challenge, but that there was a compensation issue uh, that could potentially cost the government two billion dollars. We commissioned uh, the, the study that was referenced in uh, those clips. Uh, from Coopers and Librand, and we, we did it for four principal reasons. We wanted to quantify job loss because 
uh, when you look at uh, property and casualty, it, it is not a terribly, a terribly efficient industry. There's something like, George, you may have the number wrong, about 300 companies writing property and casualty. And the reality is that if, if government had stepped in, it would have been much more efficient. And, and between eight to 10,000 people would have lost their jobs. So you, we quantified job loss. We, we, uh, we quantified in a credible way what it would have cost the government to set up a public-owned uh, auto insurance system, about a billion three. We quantified uh, what uh, it would have cost had uh, foreign companies been successful in a challenge uh, to expropriation and had the government been required to pay uh, compensation, having taken measures that were tantamount to expropriation. Um, and that was about $2 billion. And, and we took a bunch of divergent studies that the industry had done over a period of years and that were sometimes contradictory and all over the map that went to the credibility of the industry and tried to weave them uh, together to give a coherent storyline. What we ended up doing was putting a strategic analysis around what for that industry was a very emotional issue. We next, having completed the study, quietly went around and saw senior public officials well before that study was released. Um, we did it for two reasons. One, uh, that, that neither they nor their ministers would be surprised at the, at the release, that they would know what it, uh, it said. Our numbers, as George noted, were, were more conservative than those the Premier gave in announcing that he was not proceeding with auto insurance. And it was, it was that final sanity check because we'd stayed in touch with economists and we'd stayed in touch with Treasury and we'd stayed in touch with Blair Tully and the people in the Insurance uh, uh, Commission uh, to make sure that we were reading the job loss and the cost of setting it up relatively accurately. Maybe one of the most important things we did was, was to keep in line a client who uh, didn't want to do more studies. They wanted to march on Queen's Park and condemn socialist hordes for, for takeover. And, uh, and I don't discount that as, uh, as, a, as a positive benefit that we as, we as lawyers bought to it. I suppose at the end of the day, part of its luck, a part of its planning in terms of timing, uh, there was no question uh, that Premier Ray was facing significant job loss and job, jobs were an issue. Uh, there's no question, too, that within Treasury they knew uh, what that deficit looked like. They, it, it just hadn't gone public yet. Um, and we, we, we went public and made it an issue uh, before uh, Treasurer Logren had, uh, had, had raised it. And, and the reality is that uh, at Premier Ray bumped into to reality as it, as it came time to introduce legislation and to proceed with auto insurance. I'd like, um, and Chairman, you tell me how much time we have to, to throw the floor open uh, briefly for questions and comments we, we might have, unless you tell me we don't have any time. Well, to I think do we that. have about uh, four or five minutes. I just want to add one or two follow up comments uh, relating to the presentation on the video and George's comments and your comments, and that goes to the issue of credibility. Credibility of the players in terms of the numbers that were being put out. Um, not only did we have a, 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 some companies that wanted to do things differently, but we had the industry association called the Insurance Bureau of Canada, who were all over the map. There were large companies, there were small companies, there were foreign-owned companies, there were Canadian companies. That organization had the good sense to hire a good lobbyist, which was happened to be George Cook at the time, and he brought that group together after a lot of screaming and shouting internally to speak publicly with one voice. And so when George went to see a public servant, he could speak uh, for the organization and they had credible positions. Sometimes the extreme positions were cast aside because there wasn't a consensus, but it was a significant achievement and that took a good first class lobbyist firm to achieve that. Secondly, the selection of Coopers and Librand, that just wasn't an accidental, uh, another accounting firm to do a study. Coopers and Librand happened to be the auditors for the uh, the insurance uh, government run scheme in the British Columbia, so they knew of which they spoke. They were the so-called industry experts. I think they were auditors for something like 60 to 70 percent of the auto insurers in, in, in the country and a significant presence in the United States. So when Coopers and Librand put their name on a document, certainly those in government knew that this just wasn't another study spun out of thin air. Thirdly, we did have some help from some other law firms, and this is a, perhaps an interesting perspective. Uh, for you. When Michael said we raised the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement, this wasn't just a couple of lawyers sitting in Toronto reading the Free Trade Agreement and saying, well, what does this mean for us? We were working hand-in-hand -hand with Arnold Porter, one of the best uh, 
government relations law firms in the United States with head office in Washington, and uh, we had very carefully construed the arguments. They had made representations to the USTR and the Department of Commerce, which in turn made representations to the Department of International Trade, and Ottawa was quietly waiting in the wings, watching this whole thing play out very carefully. Uh, we would not have done that as a Toronto firm. It was far better done through a Washington firm, which was the U.S. counsel to, to, to the American firm, going through their channels, and then you have government to government uh, communications going properly back and forth. That wasn't a decisive factor, but throw in with all the other factors, like the Coopers and Librand study, the demonstrations, the quiet lobby of the IBC, and the polling data, which George had, and quite frankly, never underestimate the importance of polling on an almost weekly basis to give us a feeling of not only where the government was generally, but where the public was on that issue. You could make strategic decisions <coughs> and move ahead. I might, I might just add one comment to that. Um, one of the keys, there was another lobby that went on, but there were some very um, significant American parents and Michael and Ron had access, if you will, to the boardrooms uh, in the parents in the states that we would never otherwise have had. And uh, lobbying activity in Canada is quite different uh, these days at times than it might otherwise be in uh, Texas, shall we say. You don't pull out your gun and shoot somebody. You, uh, you have to go about it a different way. And there were a number of very quiet lobbies within lobbies that uh, I would say suggest were absolutely instrumental to helping us keep control of this thing. It wasn't one person that controlled it. It was a, a group of people working in any number of different ways. It's, it's quite extensive. Question? The um, question re related to the how how this lobby used polling data and uh, and uh, public relations communications to to get across its uh, its points. We um, we had a, a lobbyist who was um, seen by the NDP as independent. We used Inside Canada, but was seen by the NDP as uh, independent, and we actually made the information all of the information we had from our polling people available to the premier throughout the entirety of the. Uh, of the ordeal, which is an odd tact to take. Um, we did what we call rolling polling, if you will, so that we could we could pick up weekly trends and movements um, as well as absolute levels. And um, we made that information available as well so that all the time that, for example, the Premier was in his free fall, um, he could not only see that he was in it, but he could also see why he was in it. And you could draw the conclusions as to what the public ownership issue might do to continue it, for example. It wasn't us interpreting it, it was us making it available to him. So we had it, we used it. I might say that where FAIR made, I think, a critical mistake, they retained a, uh, they retained a, a polling agency, you know, helped them craft the questions for the polling agency, and the questions were so dreadfully self-serving, the integrity of the entire polling exercise went down the drain, and then they would only reluctantly make it available. So there was a very interesting contrast, one side to the other. Uh, in terms of advertising and communication, we uh, made use of focus tests. We, we continually focus tested our messages so that we would not only get the right message, but we would get it out the right way. And we used professional, um, uh, professional communicators and advertising people in terms of the, uh, the composition of ads or, or the way in which it went. Um, oftentimes using unconventional media. We, we used uh, community newspapers. We used our local grassroots lobby to place it in the community newspapers. Radio we used radio ads rather than TV. You know, you're driving to and from work. Um, um, we used, I mean, the, the, the most definitive article on this entire issue, in my view, is in Now Magazine, which, of course, is not what we would most likely read, but we forget that the NDP might, and uh, in fact did. Uh, those kinds of things were, were very, very consciously undertaken. Uh, drive your uh, public affairs government relations strategy? Well, we, no, no. We, we, we use the research uh, extensively. The research, the research combined with our, our understanding of the issue, which turned out to be right, and I don't just mean jobs and investments, but how it related to other agenda items of the government, why the timing was important, it drove the timing. Okay? One more question at the back. 
If I may, I'll repeat the question. The um, uh, lobbies of the type we've just heard described are quite expensive. Um, where do public policy groups, um, not-for-profit not groups, stand in, in terms of, of these issues? Um, what, uh, what are those bodies able to do in terms of the obvious expense of mounting a type of campaign that we've just described today? Um, may I make a comment? I think others may want to as well. Um, our uh, lobby costs on this issue were about one-fifteenth of what the government piddled down the drain um, on its uh, review of, uh, of the issue and its own communication costs. Um, sure. I just, want, I, just, I just thought that was an important point. Um, secondly, there's a lot of nonprofit uh, public interest groups that have, have points of views and are identified with issues. Uh, my own my own view is is that those that are in government typically understand the cost constraints they have, and those groups are, are afforded much greater access and accommodation in part because of it. Um, secondly, I know in our own lobby firm we did um, what we would basically call free work for certain certain public interest groups it had nothing to do with auto insurance, but. Uh, have to do with uh, everything from education to certain environmental issues where we made our expertise available to them for nothing um, as part of, what, uh, part of what we otherwise did. I guess the third comment I would make, um, I see our friends from Arch uh, in the room today, um, uh, they were um, a very um, uh, strong advocate on the, on the part of the uh, um, uh, handicapped, if you will, the, the victims in this in this particular issue, and I think we're successful in many many ways. I suspect without a very large budget, um, it was done through their own creativity and the fact that they were able to uh, take advantages of a of a sincerely held agenda, as opposed to uh, being viewed as opportunistic by those they were dealing with. And so, I don't think that that lobbying is only a game for the rich, and there's only access for those that have money. May I add that some of the most effective Tier 2 lobbyists I've seen are, are those who are associated with not-for-profit public interest groups. Um, I'm, I'm on the board of, uh, of several of them, and those bodies make very effective use of their board of directors. <coughs> Boards of directors are carefully chosen. Um, the, the Canadian Opera Company, uh, with, with which I'm familiar, um, never goes into an election without having a variety of the right kind of people who are set to go on the board or already on the board. And I, and I, as George said, I don't, I don't think there's, uh, there's a group or a law firm around who, who, uh, for the right cause and, and uh, in terms of community law, wouldn't, wouldn't assist on a pro bono basis that kind of group. <clears throat> Have we time for one more, Mr. One Chairman? question. Uh, I heard a lot of uh, lobbying efforts being directed against the pay in respect of the auto insurance program. How and to what effect was there any degree of coordination or avoiding overlapping uh, in those efforts? Let me answer that, John. There were some difficulties initially until, quite frankly, I think the the Insurance Bureau of Canada gave its its uh, professional lobbyists uh, a fairly carte blanche to liaise with all the companies and their counsel. And, uh, and uh, in this case, you had professionals who were willing to work together, even though our interests were somewhat different in part, uh, on the basis of no surprises, of no going public without consulting the other. And I think here it was an effective industry association who came to the realization is that uh, divided they fall, united they stand. And uh, some knocking of heads together, and including, and, 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 and without being too, too specific about a client, law firms being retained to bring their clients to heel, if you will. 
uh, and to, to become, become team players. And so the job of the lawyers wasn't to go out in the front lines and do some of the things you saw in the clip, but was to talk reason and common sense to their clients to join the team, it'll be more effective in the long term. And that's also part of the lawyering skill. A very important, very important point, not only in terms of, of the skill set that was brought to bear, but because of the access that the, the lawyers would have had, my friend to my left had, that I did not have as an example. Well, thank you very much, Michael and uh, George and Harry, uh, for a very instructive case. We're now going to turn to the moment that I know many of you have been waiting for, where having listened to the uh, lobbyists and the lawyers and the non-lawyers alike, uh, we are now going to hear from a person who probably is lobbied by more individuals, more lawyers in the province of Ontario than any other pu public servant cur currently holding office. Um, Judith Wolfson, um, as Deputy Minister of Consumer Commercial Relations, uh, has an unbelievable portfolio of responsibilities. And I just have to mention a few for you. Um, beverage, alcohol, real estate, automobile sales, horse racing. One of our earlier panelists here this morning was off to the Racing Commission, and he wanted you to know that, Judith. Uh, charitable gaming, land and companies registration, vital statistics, and trade negotiations with the United States on matters affecting the sale and distribution of beer. Now, that's enough to keep a whole law firm busy and she is one person who handles this. Judith is, is well qualified uh, to come to us and share some of these views with us. She is a lawyer. Um, she has uh, practiced with the firm of McCarthy and & Tetro, and uh, she uh, spent a few years there before joining the uh, Ministry of Consumer and Commercial Relations, and then was over Deputy Minister of Governmental, Intergovernmental Affairs, and uh, she was also for a period of time an ADM, Policy and Development in the Ministry of Industry, uh, trade and technology. So she has seen a good deal of the central or inner workings of the government of Ontario and has dealt, I know, with a number of professionals and her current responsibilities indeed uh, are central to uh, the current case briefs of a number of lawyers, including some in, in this room. So Judith, please come and share with us your thoughts. And you may speak either from the lectern or the table, whatever you prefer. Well, thank you, uh, Ron. Thank you for inviting me. The last time I was in this room was, I think, our last course in bar ads, which was accounting at the time. I think after I did so dismally, they decided to take it off as a major course uh, here. But I am delighted uh, to have the opportunity. You've heard views today, many views I know, uh, from the other side, as I say it, not the dark side. Um, I'm going to give you the view as the lobby E today. Indeed, uh, George is right, Deputy Minister sometimes lobby, always on the right side. Uh, but today I want to talk to you about being a lobby E. And uh, Ron talked about the uh, 10 helpful hints. I'll give you Eloise's helpful hints as a Deputy Minister for being a, a lobbyist. Specifically, as the Deputy Minister of uh, Provincial Ministry, I'd like to talk to you about the climate for change in this government, about new roles of the government, specifically government and the private sector doing business together, and indeed lobbying as a way of interfacing between the private sector and the government. It's not that lobbying in and of itself is of singular importance, but rather that interface that is created between the two sectors that lobbying creates. A first principle is that new approaches to partnerships and consultative processes between business and labor can provide key opportunities to influence the policy process of government and the development of ensuing legislation and regulation. Let me begin first by setting a framework for what's happened in the provincial government from my perspective over the past three years, as well as providing some insight into the challenges that government faces and new directions in which it's headed. One of the things I first learned when I became a civil servant six years ago is you don't talk about problems, you talk about challenges. And uh, that's what I'd like to do. Hopefully it'll give you a context for what I'll be outlining later in my remarks. Words like constraint, 
Downsizing, delayering, streamlining, they're not government jargon. These days they reflect reality in its truest sense. Across the public sector, there's a necessity to respond to the tremendous fiscal and economic challenges facing Ontario. Controlling the provincial debt is a key priority of the government. And the government has undertaken several initiatives to reduce spending. You may be aware that a public sector-wide expenditure control plan was initiated along with the amalgamation and restructuring of several provincial ministries and, of course, the recently negotiated social contract between the government and its public servants. For provincial ministries, these cost-cutting measures have meant that we have had to put many of our programs and legislation under a microscope. That meant looking at developing new approaches to doing business, questioning what services we provide and how we provide them, and asking ourselves if we are the right organization indeed to provide those services at all. At the same time the government has had to deal with these tough fiscal realities, it has also pursued an agenda which focuses on econo economic renewal and social justice. In light of these circumstances, those of us working to support the government in its management and policy initiatives have to look beyond traditional ways to provide input into the policy development and program design and implementation processes. We have to do things differently because we have to make decisions faster. We need to be more responsive to our clients, who are the people of Ontario, and we need to be more fiscally responsive and responsible. And basically, partnerships are the what's different in terms of doing things differently. What's different in terms of this government is that, frankly, more than ever before, although some may find this hard to believe, this government has a willingness to open itself up to new partnerships. The role of government is no longer limited to regulator, protector, or service provider. The emerging role is something that's going to facilitate value added to the economy. And this means government cannot be expected to do everything. The facilitation through partnership is a new dimension. And together with the private sector, we can jointly provide service, not the government on its own, nor the private sector on its own. In some jurisdictions, governments have attempted to do everything themselves or, to the other extreme, opt primarily for privatization. Here in Ontario, the government of the day is looking at a full range on that spectrum. Some direction will lead to the private sector assuming primary responsibility for activities. Some the government will do itself, and indeed, some will be done through partnerships. Now, we've all heard uh, the catch phrases of partnership and consultation. And what they mean, indeed, to me, is simply a way in which interest groups can work together with government for a common purpose. These are not the only means of getting one's position across to government, but they can be very effective if done properly. Let me take a few moments to give you examples of two kinds of partnerships. And some of you may be aware and have more involvement in some of these than others. One, a commercial partnership like the Terranet Land Information Services Incorporated. And two, a legislative partnership regarding reforms to the Condominium Act. In both cases, my ministry, indeed it has uh, an enormous uh, arm that stretches out across uh, many areas. You forgot uh, that we regulate films as well, uh, both porn films and, and other kinds. Uh, my ministry, Consumer and Commercial Relations, has worked closely with our stakeholders in advancing common objectives through partnership and consultation. I am sure many of you have heard of Terranet. Terranet represents a unique private-public partnership. It's the strategic alliance the ministry developed with the private sector to automate the province's land registration information system and ultimately establish a new industry based on the computerization of this data. Automating land records will produce greater efficiencies for the ministry and our clients. It has powerful applications for municipal planning and the potential to spin off many businesses. 
It is also expected to lead to opportunities in international technology sales and consulting work relating to the implementation of this technology in other countries. And indeed, there is already interest in this um, from many Eastern European countries. Terranet has provided an excellent case study in commercial partnerships between government and business. I'd like to review some of the lessons that we've learned from this kind of commercial partnership, which may be of value to you in your role as lobbyist. For this kind of venture, we want our partners to be technically and financially qualified and dependable. Partners also have to demonstrate that their company is sound and that they will carry through with their commitments. This sounds fairly obvious, but it's lessons that we've learned. But in addition, entering into a joint venture with government, business must be prepared to take on some of the accountability that government has for its actions. This translates into understanding and accepting what the government's objectives are. It means being open to public scrutiny by the media and by public agencies such as the provincial auditor, the Freedom of Information Commission, the Ombudsman's Office. All of these factors are relevant to anyone lobbying for a new partnership. And as many of you here well know, there are plenty of opportunities. Now, let me turn to an excellent example of a successful legislative partnership. And this involved the proposed reforms to the Condominium Act. The proposed condominium reform legislation will modernize the Act and its regulations, which frankly have not kept pace with the dramatic changes in the condo marketplace in recent years. Once in effect, the Act should help make certain problems both consumers and developers commonly encounter a thing of the past. For instance, inadequate sale disclosure requirements have led to unpleasant surprises for some consumers after they sign agreements to purchase a condo. The new legislation will help ensure buyers clearly understand what they're buying into. Proposed changes under the Act also remove unnecessary roadblocks to condominium development by streamlining the registration approvals process. Developers will save time and money since it will not be necessary to get separate registrations, easement agreements, management contracts, which are now required for each stage of condominium development. In the development of the condominium legislation, we had representatives from the condominium community, ranging from builders to managers to individual owners, who sat down with the ministry staff to talk over concerns they had with this extremely complex piece of legislation. And indeed, I am responsible for 59, I think was the latest count. Uh, it's probably 59 with the new Casino Act. That, that's coming in. Um, and of all the pieces of legislation for which I am responsible, I think the Condominium Act, as one of my colleagues here is nodding sagely, who's involved with it, I think it's the most complex piece of legislation that I've had to deal with. In many ways, these discussions reflected the interests of three different groups, consumers, industry, and government. And together, over a long period of time and much, much work, we were able to discuss and resolve issues as they came along. In my view, this is a first-rate approach to a legislative partnership and an illustration of the highest form of cooperation. It's a textbook case of lobbying in its purest form, one that not only benefits the individual interest group, but the government's objective of providing better public policy. And whether the lobbying effort is on behalf of broader interest groups to develop partnerships or policy or an individual client, obviously there are right ways and wrong ways to approach government to further these interests. And it's my view that your chances for success are greatly improved if you remember to follow some very basic rules, some of which you've heard this morning but I think they bear repeating. Number one, define your question. That's sometimes very difficult, but it's terribly important to know who to go to and for what. It's not always easy to know, and it requires sufficient research and upfront work. Sometimes a single pointed effort is the option of choice. Sometimes a scattered approach is better. 
understanding the issue and then the appropriate government structure is of paramount importance. Two, identify the problem and present alternative solutions. I know that's been discussed somewhat this morning, but just dumping a problem in the government's lap is not helpful. A range of solutions or options is better, maybe some that give you everything you want, and some where it's not a win-lose situation, but a win-win, even a smaller win-win than you might desire or that your client might desire. Three, present your position from a prepared and informed perspective. Remember that those in government who are dealing with these issues spend a great deal of time researching them and understanding them. Four, appreciate the positions of other interest groups and stakeholders. Coming in with a dogmatic view is not helpful. Five, understand government priorities and government sensitivities. Six, make sure as much as possible that positions you wish to represent to the government reflect the broadest consensus of your industry. We just heard that uh, discussed in the auto insurance situation, but indeed it is far more helpful to bring a consensus rather than a single position to the government. Seven, and I cannot stress this too much, be aware that accountability and public scrutiny go hand in hand with any joint venture with government. We live in a fishbowl and everything that the government does is a, we must be accountable for in the public eye. And therefore anybody that is working with government has to understand that accountability. Eight. Old-style lobbying, for the most part, is a thing of the past. Solution-based lobbying is the present, and I would suggest the future. Let me describe some endeavors that clearly illustrate what the Ontario government would expect from those who seek partnerships or seek to influence a change of government policy. And my first example is the Ontario Casino Initiative. As you can well imagine, the commercial opportunities in this area have led to intense activity in many sectors immediately after the government announced its intentions to establish casino gambling in Ontario. To select a commercial operator to run a casino, it became apparent that the ministry needed to follow a very structured yet open and fair selection process, one that was not influenced by lobbying efforts in the traditional sense. Through the Ontario Casino Project, an invitation was extended to potential proponents interested in bidding on the initial casino pilot in Windsor, with specific rules governing how these bids have to be put forward and how the selection is to be made. I am sure it is clearly understood by firms advising proponents involved in the casino initiative that the selection process must proceed within the parameters I just mentioned parameters that were in force leading up to the announcement of the shortlist of proponents last week. Although the conventional form of lobbying was not permitted to happen in this context, and indeed is not happening uh, as I speak, advisors did have an important role to play in ensuring that objective information was presented to the government in accordance with the rules set out in the bidding process. The important, the most important message that you can convey to your clients in situations like the Casino Project Initiative is that they must recognize the integrity of the selection process, the significance of fully meeting specifications set out in the tender, and the need for the successful bidder to conduct business within the context of accountability and public scrutiny as a partner of the provincial government. Another example reflects the Ministry's recent involvement in very important commercial and international negotiations to resolve the beer trade dispute between Canada and the United States. This issue resulted in an important working relationship between the brewing industry, its unions, and two levels of government, provincial and federal. It was a mean feat. 
There was also inter-ministry consultation, something that lobbyists should keep in mind when private public sector relationships are being formed. In other words, more than one government ministry may be involved. And it is important that you do your homework with all of the ministries that may be affected. In this extended partnership, we had to weave together the three elements of consultation, policy development, and implementation. Let me put this into perspective for you. Historically, our beer industry has developed within the context of provincial and federal statutes and Ontario's business environment, with the province encouraging the growth of its domestic beverage alcohol sector. However, interprovincial and international pressures expose provincial barriers to beer trade. As you may know, the GATT concluded that discriminatory marketing practices existed in the United States and Canada, particularly citing Ontario's marketing practices. After some very intense and complex negotiations, an agreement was reached which resolved the trade war early in August. The Canada-US agreement recognized our priorities in the areas of pricing, distribution, and environmental policy, principles which were sanctioned by GATT. With hundreds of millions of dollars at stake annually, you can well imagine that during these negotiations we were lobbied extensively by various commercial, labour, environmental and public interest groups with a stake in Ontario's beer industry. Just as we had to appreciate the commercial and competitive issues which were of concern to the industry, so too did they have to understand the government's responsibility to maintain a viable beer industry, to protect jobs in Ontario, to safeguard the environment and to generate revenue from this source. I'm pleased to say, however, that by working together, we were able to effectively pursue a common goal to a successful conclusion. Ontario honoured its international GATT commitments by amending provincial liquor regulations. In cooperation with our industry partners, we have implemented the necessary changes related to domestic beer marketing practices. We are now GATT consistent and also able to provide the US and the European community with appropriate access to our domestic marketplace. Because of the relationship that was developed between the industry associations, individual companies, the unions and the government, we were able to share information, establish a consistent communication strategy and put forward a position relating to the issues of the environment, revenue, product distribution, and minimum pricing. Indeed, not all the players like all aspects of the deal. However, as in any negotiation, there is a process of compromise. All positions put forward were considered, and those compromises made. Let me outline for you some of the features which I considered to be good representation made by the various parties to us throughout these negotiations. As you know, the beer industry in Ontario is regulated by my ministry under the Liquor Control Act and the Liquor Licence Act. Therefore, many of the players have worked over the years to establish a solid, ongoing relationship with the government. Even though there is great competition between individual partners in the beer industry in establishing their market share, a long-term industry-wide relationship generates a high degree of credibility when a single focus issue such as the Canada-US beer dispute emerges. Many of the stakeholders also came to the table with a good appreciation of the fiscal environment facing the government and an understanding of the government's priorities. Understanding the complexities of process and appreciating that government has a, responsi a responsibility to balance the interests of many was key to developing a satisfactory strategy. The various parties also presented us with a very focused and quantified description of their problems and concerns. A great deal of work, a great deal of research went to the, into those descriptions. Those concerns among all the parties were not always mutual. However, the parties did suggest alternative solutions 
that demonstrated a sensitivity to government priorities. As mentioned before, the labor management relations aspect, job protection, revenue generation, and the environment. Another observation, and this is one with which we lawyers have experience, is, as I stated earlier, that the resolution of any dispute involves compromise. In this regard, our partners at the beer trade negotiating table had to be flexible and had to recognize the importance of a settlement. This was very important to the government, industry and unions, since we all had a common interest to develop the best solution possible to the problem. <clears throat> Let me wrap up my remarks by stating the obvious. From my perspective, and I think from yours and from many others, it's a different world out there. The traditional ways of playing the game are gone forever. Today, I've attempted to give you some examples of new approaches and how partnerships will likely be developed between government and the private sector in the future. Within this perspective, there are competing but not incompatible interests. From your perspective, I'd suggest you have a responsibility to your clients. We in government respect that bottom line. From our perspective, what we hope to accomplish is good public policy. And the benefits to government of having knowledgeable, helpful partners in the private sector. By working together, both perspectives can be merged together in the public interest. Expertise in government relations, I would suggest, is an ever increasingly important part of a law firm's appeal, as is continued participation in the dialogue, in exchanging views, in talking face to face, and trying to understand the differing and sometimes uh, similar perspectives. I enjoy uh, entering into that discussion. I hope it will continue. I thank you. Will you? Sure. Uh, Judith has agreed to uh, take a few minutes before we head upstairs for lunch and uh, take your questions. And it's a, it's a brave deputy minister that comes into a classroom full of lawyers and, and is willing to uh, subject yourself to questions. And if you, you don't have some, I have one or two, but I'll call first from the floor. Questions? Well, the, the first one, and I, and I suspect you, you may have uh, th this is not to put you on the spot, but the issue ran earlier when we were talking about registration and regulations of lobbyists. And we have, I think, three people in the, in the audience from Ottawa who are responsible for uh, either administration or developing the policy of lobbyist registration. In the context of the current election campaign, both the government and the main opposition party have committed to implementing new amendments to lobbyist registration reform. What can we expect from Queen's Park? A very unhelpful response, Ron. I don't know. Um, I think I read in, in some of your notes ahead of time that one is expecting Queen's Park to come down in a very similar vein, and I can certainly understand uh, the reasons for it. Um, I think government, I, I personally have not heard anything uh, as at this point in time. I think uh, there are a couple other preoccupations of the day. Um, and I don't think, and perhaps my ignorance is overwhelming here, I don't think this has been a pressing problem that the government is feeling. I think that there has been an openness to date uh, in the process in Ontario, certainly from my perspective. I do think those concerns are real. I think they will be addressed, but I don't see anything in the immediate offing uh, that I'm aware of. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Judith has uh, brought with her copies of her paper, and I think it's probably punched with three holes, and it will go in the back of your binder as the last and perhaps most important addition to the collection of materials you're going to take away from this program today. On your behalf, I want to thank Judith thank for you. coming and joining with us. She'll stay a few minutes for lunch. Those of you who, who didn't have the courage to uh, pose your question in public, uh, session here, please uh, feel free to approach Judith or any of the panelists at the luncheon discussion. Uh, this session is
formally adjourned and informally will uh, remove itself to the third floor of the Barrister's Lounge for a light lunch. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for the Law Society for hosting us.